Well, Madam Chair, first of all, thank you for uh, convening this hearing and thank you for allowing me to make a, just a very brief opening uh, comments. So I'll, I'll put my entire statement in the record if, if you would permit me to do that. Uh, let me um, uh, thank our witnesses uh, for their work. Uh, Russia is an important uh, country for the United States in our relationship with Russia. It's important in our fight against terrorism. It's important in our work within the United Nations, within Europe, and with, around the world. So it's, it's an issue that we all take very, very seriously as to how we can improve the relationship between our two con countries. But what we have seen in Russia are troubling trends. We saw that most recently in the Duma elections, where, which were anything but fair and free and open, the intimidations that were used, and now the concern as to how Russia will handle legitimate protests against the manner in which that election was conducted. We see that in the safety of journalists who have been intimidated against investigative reporting. And we see it in widespread corruption within the, the Russian government. Uh, as, uh, as the chairman indicated, I have the honor of being the Senate chair of the U.S. Helsinki Commission, which is one of our oldest human rights organizations. We monitor human rights, uh, certainly within the, the, uh, the OSCE um, uh, geography, but, uh, but basically globally. Uh, and we will bring out uh, the, the, what's happening in countries, and in Russia it, it's very concerning to us, the, the amount of human rights violations. But people sort of gloss over the numbers. But when you have an individual case, I think people can relate to just the tragedy of what's happening. And Sergei Magnitsky is, is an example of a person who tried to do the right thing. As the chairman pointed out, he was representing a client and discovered corruption within the governmental system. So he did what he should have done, brought it to the attention of the Russian authorities. And he paid a heavy price for doing that. He was arrested on trumped-up charges and thrown in prison. He was tortured. And then we believe he, the higher authorities instructed the prison system not to give him health care to meet his needs. And he died in prison. So that's why we all get concerned about this, is that there are so many Sergei Magnitsky's that are out there. And unless we put a spotlight on this, it will just continue. So we are concerned about this, and we are concerned about how Russia is responding to this. The bill that I filed on behalf of many of my colleagues makes it clear that if you violate basic human rights, don't ask for the privilege to visit the United States. We think that is something we should all be doing. And I applaud the administration for taking action under the authority that they have, which, by the way, I pointed out with a letter that we wrote before following our legislation, that th that authority exists, of denying people the right for a visa to come to America if they have violated basic human rights. That needs to be done. But because the U.S. acted, the international community is now acting. And we're finding other countries are passing similar statutes to deny the rights of those who have violated human rights to visit their country. That's leadership. And Madam Chair, we know at the same time that Russia is moving for a mission within the WTO. And in order for that to be effective in the United States, we have to repeal what's known as the Jackson-Vanik Law. Jackson-Vanik was passed by Congress to speak about human rights, the basic right for people to emigrate from the former Soviet Union. That's how Jackson Vanek came about. It was a human rights connection. And I think it's right for us to be asking that if we want to have normal trade with Russia, we have a right to expect that they will adhere to basic human rights. And that's why, Madam Chair, I am so pleased that you're holding this hearing where we can explore the human rights record within the Russia Federation. Thank you very much, Senator Cardin. I'm pleased to welcome our first panel this morning, uh, Dr. Phil Gordon, who's the Assistant Secretary of State at the Bureau for European and Eurasian Affairs. And we also have Thomas Melia, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State at the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Thank you both for being here. Um, 
Dr. Gordon, would you like to begin? Senator Cardin. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And let me start, uh, Secretary Gordon, in thanking you and the administration for the manner in which you have been very clear about the human rights agenda and the problems within Russia. Uh, I very much uh, support uh, your efforts in that regard. And I, I do want to just underscore that from your statement, which I totally agree with, when you say we do not seek to impose our system on anyone else and change within Russia must be internally driven. I completely agree with that. Nevertheless, we will continue to work with Russian partners to foster democracy and respect for human rights by encouraging transparent and accountable government and strengthening civil society. The United States must be in leadership in this regard. The international community looks to the United States. And if we don't stand up, unfortunately, it's not going to happen. So we have to be unambiguous as to the expectations. You mentioned the fact that of the advantages of Russia entering the World Trade Organization from the point of view of transparency and other issues. But let me just point out that the WTO is not a panacea. China is a member of WTO. We have our problems with China on trade. And I remember very vividly when China entered the WTO, we said that would be an opportunity for America to advance human rights in China. And we, of course, en enacted a mechanism, commission that does meet. It has some impact. But I would hope that what we have learned from that experience is that we have to set the bar higher when we have opportunities to advance human rights. And then recently, in the OSCE, Kazakhstan, a former republic within the Soviet Union, came forward and wanted to be chair in office. And the United States was very clear about that, that we welcomed a Central Asian nation to take on the chairmanship of the OSCE, but we expected human rights advancements for the chair to be of the OSCE, the premier international organization on human rights. We want to see the country that hosts the chairmanship make the advancements. And we got some progress, but we should have set the bar higher. So I point this out as to what we can expect to come out as you seek to enact permanent normal trade relations with Russia and repeal the Jackson-Vanik law. You point out that while we believe Jackson-Vanik has long since accomplished the goals for which it was adopted, we want to work together with Congress to address our shared concerns about human rights in Russia. And then you go on to point out that more needs to be done. We're in agreement. So what should we do? We have an opportunity to advance human rights. The international community is looking at us. Uh, the issue that I have brought forward with many of my colleagues on the Meninsky bill is to say that we should at least uh, uh, use uh, the visa applications and look at asset freezes for human rights violators. That has gained international credibility and support. Europe is looking at similar restrictions. Uh, my question to you is, can you give us a, a roadmap as to how we can use the next several months to come together with the expectations of what we should be doing uh, to establish human rights advancements in Russia and hold them accountable uh, as we look to uh, enact permanent normal trade relations with Russia. Uh, thank you, Senator Cardin. You make a number of important points. Let me try to address all of them, and starting with thanking you for your leadership on this issue. What you said about leadership is is absolutely right. Somebody has to uh, get out there and lead the charge, and and what you have done has been a spur to our actions and uh, and the actions of others across the world, in, including in Europe, and, and we're very grateful for that. Uh, WTO membership for Russia is indeed not a panacea, on either on the trade matters or on, on human rights. Uh, there are no panaceas in that regard. We do think it will help. We think the transparency will help. We think the rules-based organization will help. But we're not pretending that this is going to be a magic wand that will really achieve all of our goals on human rights in Russia. Uh, we agree, therefore, that we need other mechanisms 
uh, to continue to promote human rights and democracy in Russia. I guess the point I would make about this constellation of issues having to do with Jackson Vanek and the WTO is that Jackson Vanek is not the answer either. So when some may suggest that since WTO itself isn't the answer, we need to keep Jackson Vanek as some sort of lever to get the Russians to respond on democracy and human rights, that's not the lever. It's been on the books for 40 years. Its specific aims have been achieved, and it is standing in the way of what we think are some really important uh, benefits we would get from Russia's WTO membership. And I stress that we would get, this is not a gift to Russia. Uh, it, is a, it is in the interests of U.S. exporters, businesses, and the United States in general.